the next talk is uh, Jeffrey Vetter is going to talk to us about uh, making SDRs more portable in the area of heterogeneous thought. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope you had a chance to go out and grab some lunch. Uh, it's an it's a interesting experience here. Uh, my colleague, Sayong Lee, is with me, and he's going to help me give a, a part of the talk. So uh, you've already heard several of these things this morning where, where people are porting SDR to different heterogeneous architectures. And I would argue that's, that's not just a, an SDR phenomenon. We're going to see that everywhere. At DOE, for example, all of our next supercomputers are going to be GPU-based. And so we have lots of users struggling with how to uh, port to these, these architectures. So we're part of a, a DSOC uh, program, and we're investigating the performance portability SDR. We've done a lot of uh, profiling and trying to understand target architectures, and this really isn't different from what we do with our DOE applications. It's different software, of course, but we sit down. We don't know astrophysics. We don't know materials design. We sit down with those uh, people and try to learn how to to make their applications perform well on these architectures. And so that's what we're doing here. Um, we're trying to use open programming models to do this. Um, one of the things that's really important is uh, uh, future-proofing your application so you don't have to worry about new architectures uh, needing to uh, recode your, your application because of that. And then finally, uh, intelligent runtime systems. We've heard a lot about earlier uh, we think that's going to play an increasingly important role in addition to code generation and the performance um, of the applications. And the goal that we're looking at is being able to take, you know, untouched the same application and run it on a Qualcomm Snapdragon and run it on the largest supercomputer in the world. And, and just see if we can meet that goal. Now, it may not, may not happen, but that's the challenge we're aiming for. So... Just a, a short note about specialization. So um, I love this chart by Ray Kurzweil that talks about the growth of computing since uh, 1900, and it really shows you where we are today. We're, we're nearing the end there where we've had some outstanding gains from CMOS scaling and other things. Now we're really getting into this transition period, um, and I label it the sixth wave. Um, I think there's a lot of things that are going to happen, and we're already seeing a lot of this. The first one is people are, are really specializing their applications and optimizing their code for the architectures we have. The other one that I'm not going to talk about is emerging technologies. You know, have you seen all the excitement about quantum computing and neuromorphic computing and all these other things? Um, that's what what people are looking for, really, the next computational paradigm. Today, we're, I'm going to really focus on architectural specialization. I think this is where we'll be for, for perhaps 10 years or more, where we take the, the CMOS, which is an incredible technology, and, and just specialize it for workloads. And so that's, that's the specialization part. And it's really important that you get the specialization right. Now, a consequence of that is that the architectures start to yield very complex programming models. And this schematic I use for talking about high-performance computing in the sense that, you know, even if you are in astrophysics or uh, material design or climate modeling, um, your application these days has to be made up of this stack where you have maybe MPI, some threading model on the SMP, and then if you're using an accelerator, uh, OpenACC, CUDA, OpenCL, something like that. And it really varies across platforms. Um, CUDA's not available everywhere. Of course, it's proprietary. <coughs> Other things like OpenCL may or may not be available. And so when you look at it in that context, really, uh, and this is, this is generally for the DSSOC program, is first, how do you design that architecture? I show up on your doorstep and say I have 10 billion transistors they're yours, what do you want on your chip? How do you analyze your workload? And so part of our project focuses on looking at SDR to try to understand what, what those features would be. The second one is programmability. You know, how, you know, is it really possible to design an application with one language and programming model that will run across all these architectures and you get reasonable performance out of them? Um, that's, you know, a question. but it's going to impact 
all these teams writing applications and software. Um, they, they only have so much time to spend on science and, and porting software. And so this was um, the, the DARPA program, uh, and it has you know, three different areas. Some of them I've already mentioned and I'll talk more about in a moment. But the important part here is you really do assume that you're going to have, you know, SOCs and they're going to be very diverse. I'm talking way more than an ARM CPU and an ARM GPU. They may have inference engines, they may have FPGAs and other things on them. And, and you've already heard about some of the complexity dealing with those when you just, just have one. And so the overall structure of our project really uh, started out like this. Um, you know, we were looking at applications. We we're using a, a ontology framework to try to capture the differences and the properties of things in SDR. Um, then the programming system is what Sayong is going to talk about. This is really static analysis and code generation. So if you're going to run, uh, you know, your SDR module on an FPGA, you just heard a great talk about what all goes into that, right? Is there any way we can simplify that? And then next, you've got the uh, runtime system. And, and, you know, there's a big question there. You know, will Linux evolve to handle all these heterogeneous <coughs> processors and memories that are coming its way? Or will that be handed off to another runtime system? And we've developed a prototype runtime system that I'll tell you a little bit about that's trying to explore that space. And then finally is the, um, the, the hardware. And, and several of the teams in... DSOC are actually building hardware. Uh, we're not, but we're reaching out and making use of some of the more complex systems out there. Um, and this is just a kind of a timeline of how we see this manifesting itself over time. Um, I'll skip that due to time. So let's just talk a little bit about the range of hardware that we are thinking about. So, so as I mentioned earlier, we, we, we run on Summit right now, and this schematic you see, it's a 200 petaflop system at Oak Ridge. It's uh, got 27,000 voltage GPUs in it. And, and they're all configured in this node uh, schematic you see here, where you've got six GPUs and two power nines. You know, getting all those programming models that I was talking about to work properly and efficiently on that is very complex. And then you add the fact that you've got thousands of other nodes like this that are communicating at the same time and potentially doing I.O., and it's very dynamic, uh, a very dynamic system. We just heard a nice talk about FPGAs and being able to use them for, for signal processing. Uh, we're, we're looking at those. And then more recently, we've been looking at NVIDIA's Jetson, and so this is, uh, again, it's an SOC, but it's very much an aggressive design. It has ARM cores, it has a uh, voltage GPUs, smaller than what you get on a V100. It's got a deep learning accelerator and, and some other vi things like vision processors and, and vision processing accelerators. You know, that's, when you get right down to it, that's what we think the future is going to look like. We're going to have, you know, thousands of SKUs of different types of processors, and you're just going to buy the one that fits your, uh, your niche. And then, of course, there's Snapdragon. This is the one that we're focusing on this year. And, and it is, is not as well known, but more popular than, than the Xavier that I just mentioned, because they're, they're cell phone chips, right? They're very complex. They've got ARM big and little cores. They have... Uh, uh, vector accelerators, they've had a tensor accelerator like a, a training engine, and then different codecs and things like that, in addition to all the I.O. for co connectivity to 5G and so on. So it's, it's a very um, growing space, and it seems to be accelerating. So just a word about some of the application studies that we're doing, and, and we have some tools that we'll make available uh, if you're interested in looking at those. Uh, so when we put together apps, we're, you know, we're not experts in SDR. Um, we're, we're learning a lot, and so we wanted to go out and get some workflows that would allow us to, to understand how to profile and how to analyze these. We started with the Wi-Fi one, and it's in part because we really understand how to measure the performance of that 
on a on a application level. You know, if you do a file transfer and you're running it across this flow, you can get some real feedback as to error rates as well as uh, throughput. And so that's uh, that's something that we've been studying. Um, We've also built tools, and, and these tools that really focus on the ontologies and the performance analysis that I mentioned earlier. The, you know, the first few were really looking at all the flows in the system, and the later ones are, are more for profiling that. So we built some frameworks that let you uh, put these flows up, run them for, say, 30 seconds, and then do a profile of where you're spending your time in the flows. This is an example of, of where some of the time is going. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a pretty much a normal profile. The, you know, one of the questions is, you know, are we getting representative flow graphs and, you know, is 30 seconds really sufficient? Um, the cooler looking uh, analysis is this block proximity analysis. And so what we did was look at CGRAN and some of the other uh, repos we had access to. And, and what you see in this graph over here is really a networking diagram where the nodes represent basically how many times they're used and the, and the weights on the edges represent connections between those and workflows. So, and this is useful, for example, if you're trying to combine operators that you can put on, a, on an SOC that's coming down the line or maybe optimize uh, by creating a new module, for example. And that was, I, let me see if I got the, uh, yeah, so all, all of these tools are available down here on GitHub. Um, we'd love feedback on them. So next, working our way down, uh, the programming systems is where we've been spending a lot of time recently as well as the runtime system. So I'm going to let Seong tell you about our programming strategy. Yeah, I'll talk about the programming system yep. that we use. Yeah. You're on. Yeah, I'll talk about the programming system that we use to pull the GNU Radio blocks to the heterogeneous devices. This is give the overview of the system. As you can see, we use two compiler as the base one. One is the, the OpenARC and the other is the LLVM. OpenARC is the homegrown compiler developed by us. And we use the multiple programming models like uh, the OpenMP, OpenHC, Iris, and HIP, CUDA, OpenCL. So by looking at this figure, it may not be easy to understand what's going on in the programming system. So let's look at the concrete example. So this shows how we port your GNU blocks to the heterogeneous device using our framework. So basically what we assume is that user can write a program using the high-level programming model like OpenMP, OpenACC. In this example, suppose that user write a GNU block using OpenACC. Then our compiler performs the source source translation and generate the output program depending on the target architecture. That means that if you want to run your own GNU block on the NVIDIA GPU, then our compiler generates the output CUDA task, and it will run on the NVIDIA GPU. And if you want to run the, your the blocks on the, for example, ARM or other Geon file like a CPU, then our program, compiler will automatically generate the output OpenMP program and running on the Doge architecture. Likewise, depending on the target architecture, our compiler automatically generate the output kernel. And one good thing about our framework is that no matter how different type of output programming models are used, we use a common runtime called IRIS. That's the another runtime system that we developed by ourselves. So one benefit of having common runtime interface is that you can write the application where one task is running on the GPU using CUDA and another task running on the CPU using OpenMP and yet another task running on the FPGA using OpenCL, something like that. So that kind of true intermixing of the multiple different output programming models are possible by using our framework. And we also support several other new ones, like uh, HIP is another GPU programming model developed by the, the AMD. We also support like uh, another new one called the SQL, but I will not talk detail about uh, these new programming models. And for example, if you want to port your GNU blocks on the JBL like uh, SOC, then we can use the, the CUDA for the, the JBL GPU and OpenMP for the JBL CPU. And this shows the, the code structure of the OpenAC block. As you know, the original open, open, uh, GR blocks are written as a C++ class, and we follow the same structure. That means that if you want to write your own OpenACC GR block, then you have to write uh, this type of class. But one common requirement is that every OpenAC block should inherit the common the parent class called the GRACC basic block. 
what it does is that it initializes the data structure used by the open, open AC runtime, and it also assigns the unique logical thread ID to each block instance. Actually, the reason why we need that kind of the, the parent class is because of the multi-threading issue. As you know, as you learned in the, in the morning session, original GNU Radio framework provides multi-threading. That means that multiple GR blocks can execute by the multiple different threads. But the problem is that our OpenAC runtime also supports multi-threading. But the problem is that original GNU Radio block, uh, the framework uses the, the C++ the boost threading library based multi-threading, while OpenAC runtime uses the, the OpenMP based multi-threading. So two systems does not know each other. So to, to handle the multi threat safety issue by integrating two different programming, so what we did is that we introduced the concept of the logical thread. By using the logical thread idea, but the OpenAC runtime knows that what kind of the thread local data should, structure should be used. So it's a low-level detail about how to enforce the thread safety when we integrate the multiple systems. But I'll not explain all the detail. But anyway, in this OpenACC block, we provide the two implementation. One is the reference CPU implementation, which is exactly the same as the original GNU Radio block. And OpenAC implementation, that's the OpenAC version of the reference CPU version. If you write the basic OpenAC implementation, it will perform the three types of tasks. First, at the beginning of the invocation, it should copy the data from the host memory to device memory. And launch the device kernel, and at the end of the execution, we have to copy the result back to the host memory. This shows the example translation of the OpenAC block. As you can see in the left, it shows the simple OpenAC block the, the, for the, the, the GR log module. What we did here is that in addition, in, in on top of the existing CPU implementation, we just add one line of the OpenAC directive. Then our compiler automatically generates the output host program and the kernel program, depending on the target architecture. And this shows the example workflow where we used our own OpenAC GR block. So as you can see here, Top workflow use our GR OpenAC block. On the other hand, bottom workflow use the original reference GR blocks. So the only difference is that both workflows do the same thing, but one use the OpenAC block, the other use the, the reference CPU implementation. And this shows the, the, the basic management scheme for the OpenAC enabled GR workflow. So because the OpenAC, what OpenAC does is that it offloads the computation to the device, which can be a CPU, GPU, FPG, whatever. In this case, what happens is that when OpenAC block one is invoked, first you should copy data from the host device. And then after finishing the device kernel execution, then we have to write data back to the host. But in this case, there are some inefficiency. For example, if you look at the OpenAC block one and block two, actually, if you look at the green colored data, we have three copies. And there are some data transfer between host and GPU. But we don't have to do that. Because the second the OpenAC block, also it runs on the same device. In this case, we don't have to do unnecessary data transport between host and the GPU. So what we did is that if we know that both producer blocks and consumer blocks are running on the same device, then we can reduce unnecessary memory transport between host and the device. And this shows the example output of the, the, the sample workflow. And Let's look at the performance comparison. What we did here is that we compared the performance of the OpenACG block-based workflow versus the original CPU implementation-based workflow. Then in this figure, red b the block means that each OpenACG block, and green block means each reference CPU implementation. So the, if the both blocks are labeled the same thing, that means that it does the same algorithm. But one is implemented as OpenACG, the other implemented as reference CPU. And here, what we did is that we run the both OpenAC workflow and the, the reference CPU workflow on the same CPU. <coughs> As I said before, OpenAC block provides two implementation, reference CPU implementation and the OpenAC implementation. So if we target the CPU, then even OpenAC blocks just use the simple, the original the reference CPU implementation. So in this case, we have to see that both OpenAC block and the reference CPU block should run equally. But as you can see in the, for example, D2 case, D1, D2 case, our OpenAC blocks a little bit performs better than the reference CPU block because when we implement the reference CPU version inside the OpenAC block, we apply the very simple caching optimization that causes some performance difference. Let's look at the next case. In this case, what we did is that 
we offload the OpenMC block again on the CPU, but using the OpenMP as a back-end programming model. That means that instead of using the reference CPU implementation, OpenMC block uses the OpenMP implementation of that block. So here we can see in some blocks, OpenACC blocks performs better than the reference CPU implementation. But in other blocks like uh, the B and C, still reference CPU version performs better than the OpenAC block. Why? Because some of the original GNU Redux implementation was vectorized using the bulk library. That means that here what we compared is that the, the version parallelized using the OpenMP multi-threading versus the version vectorized using the bulk library. So that means this shows that depending on the characteristic, sometimes it's better to use the vectorization and sometimes it's better to use the, the multi-threading. And next, what we did here is that we offloaded the OpenAC blocks of GPU, but without any optimization about the memory transfer. As you can see here, even though we offloaded the computation to the GPU, because of the extra overhead for the memory transfer between host and the device, in most cases, GPU performs worse than the CPU version because of the memory transfer overhead. But when we applied our memory transfer optimization, we could remove some unnecessary memory transfer. So in the case, in most cases, OpenAC block performed better than CPU block. But one, there is one exception, block A. In this case, still, OpenAC, uh, the OpenAC performed worse than the reference CPU. It is because the original CPU implementation was vectorized using the folk library. That means that still we compare against the vectorization on CPU versus the parallelization on GPU. So depending on the computation, it may be still be better to run on the CPU using the vectorization. But in most other cases, if we, if we can upload the computation to the GPU and optimize the unnecessary memory transfer, then we can beat the performance of the original reference CPU. And this is the, a little bit more complex, but I'll skip that. And so what we can learn from here is that once you create your blocks using the OpenACC and create a workflow using OpenACC blocks, then you can create one workflow that can run on the multiple different type of devices together. That means that part of the, your blocks run on the GPU and part of your block run on the CPU, another part of block run on the FPG. That kind of true mixing of the, the, the heterogeneous devices is possible if you use this framework. Thank you. So uh, just one thing I wanted to say about that diagram. Um, we modified the uh, GNU radio so that we could add some attributes um, to the blocks that actually let you say where to co-locate the, the blocks. Um, ideally, that would happen automatically somewhere along the way. So there would be a phase where you could, you could basically unify some of those blocks into a, a super block and then put them on an FPGA, for example. And so... Um, we're running a little short on time. I want to uh, tell you about IRIS. So IRIS is our uh, runtime system. And so um, we've looked around. There's a lot of runtime systems out there. We, we didn't find one that ran on all the platforms with all the different programming models we wanted to run uh, for the reason Seyong mentioned. You know, some nodes just don't support certain programming models well. And so in some cases, OpenMP is a great, I'm sorry, OpenCL is a great choice. On things like Xavier, OpenCL is not, not there, so you have to use CUDA and OpenMP. And so we created this to help both orchestrate the data movement and launch, launch and manage tasks across a diverse set of system uh, uh, architectures. Um, we have several different models here. Uh, there, we, we have a memory model that also will track with a directory where your data is in these different devices and inject data movement into the execution of the tasks if necessary. And it really looks, at, looks like a DAG. So, uh, you, you know, everything in computer science at some point seems to get back to DAGs, but uh, that, that seems to be working for us. We're not talking about millions of nodes. We're talking about dozens or maybe a few hundred uh, nodes in our DAG. And then, and then uh, Seyong talked about the programming models. Here's an example of what we're running across today. So with Iris, you can take it and run it on this node, for example, that has Xeon, uh, Voltas, or, I'm sorry, Pascals, and uh, Stratix 10 in it. You can run it on a Summit node uh, using the requisite programming model on each chip, and then it runs on uh, Radeon, Xavier, and Snapdragon. And they list out, we list out what, uh, what software stack we use to do that. Um, I don't have a demo, I didn't think I had time for it, but here's snapshots of it booting on all of those platforms and you can get a feel for, for how it does that. 
Um, here it's you know, identifying that it has the CUDA platform available and loading the shared object for that and skipping things like HIP and, uh, and OpenCL. So the task scheduling is interesting. Many of you already know about task scheduling. So um, the thing I want to mention here is that you know, we're actually getting to the fun part now. We've got this nice framework that has many mechanisms in it that let us schedule things. But we want to start exploring the device selection policies. Now, you could do a simple thing like have a hint, a pragma, that says run all of these tasks on a GPU. But we could also look at things like the profile-based or the ontology-based or, or one of the original ideas we looked at was uh, using a performance model to give you a rough indication of where a task should be performed. And, so, and, then, and then once you have that, the task scheduler executes that on the ready queue uh, every time. I've got uh, a simple example here of a Saxby. Uh, and this is running on the Xavier using the GPUs and the ARM CPUs. Uh, basically, what we want to do is run uh, Saxby on the, the, the A times X on the GPU and the Y on the uh, CPU. And so one of the things that I mentioned was that we, we do have dependencies. Um, I'm running short, so I'm going to speed through this. Uh, there's a C++ interface to Iris, and there's a Python interface to Iris. The Python interface is right here. It's a lot easier to explain. Uh, you create you know, data regions with iris then you you can launch these tasks and these tasks point to code for example right there's the cuda code that that gets launched when iris submits this task and it's called up for execution uh, and you have to do the transfers and, and a identification of you know how big the data is uh, there's also the openmp version we have to execute a little uh, pre and post execution code for these but uh, we think we can automate that with things like OpenArc. And then here's the execution, uh, the memory management. So in this uh, diagram, it's not, it doesn't really stand out very much, but basically what happens is when you identify these read-write dependencies on the different data regions, you're basically telling Iris, look, there's a potential inconsistency there, and so you need to, to manage that. So it has a directory and it, it knows to go in and move the data from one device to another based on the task being completed. All right, I'll jump to work. Let me, uh, so the other thing was just that we're, we're looking at efficiency. We're trying to get, get this uh, execute. We're, we can do almost 90,000 tasks per second on both the CPU and the GPU. Um, it's online, so feel free to take a look at it and let us know what you think. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank, you know, FOSTOM and SDR and DARPA and DOE for, for funding and inspiring our work. Thank you. Thank you.